Hey there, welcome to Coffee Hour with Jose. You might be asking, who is this Hispanic guy who hacked into the Alpha Architect YouTube channel? Well, let me introduce myself. My name is Jose, per the name of the show. So what I'm gonna be doing is bringing education to investors, both beginners and advanced. And I hope you find this information useful. And if you do, go ahead and subscribe. Make sure you hit the bell to get notified every time I post a video and also make sure to share this with a friend. Without further ado, roll intro. Today, I wanted to talk about how I think about investing. And I posted about this too on X. Make sure you follow me there too, at jordoniasjr. But when I think about my own investments, I like breaking them down into their simplest components. And that's what I'm gonna be doing today. I'm gonna break down how I think about investing into three components. The first one being value. And value investing, in a nutshell, means investing in potentially undervalued securities. Now, you probably heard about value investing after all. Some of the most famous investors, including Benjamin Graham and Warren Buffett, handily beat the market using this strategy. And just for like Buffett and Graham, buying cheap securities has beat the market over the long term. But what is it about undervalued securities that makes the strategy so profitable, at least historically? Why is that even a thing? Well, we've all heard the grocery shopping analogy. When you go grocery shopping, you want to make sure you get a good deal. And one might go about doing this by making sure that you buy the things that are on sale. You can save more money for the same amount of groceries or Another way to look at it is that you buy more groceries for the same amount of money. Whichever way you look at it, value investing is the idea that you can buy more earnings or assets for a relatively lesser price as compared to other opportunities in the market. But it's not all fun and games. Value investing can actually be really painful in the short term. Many of these stocks tend to cluster in not so hot industries, industries such as industrials, energy, and retail. These sectors and companies are likely to show a higher level of of risk, but also this may be a reason as to why they tend to exhibit higher returns. And let's be honest, a lot of investors want to stay away from these sectors and companies as much as they can and go into more fun and, and cooler sectors such as tech and communications. Not just that, but because of the pain that can be experienced by holding these securities, investors tend to show behavioral biases against value investing, which in turn leaves some room for value investors to go in and garner some potential return. As an example, a lot of value stocks tend to be beat down investments where growth has dwindled and earnings are hurt. In a scenario like this, what can happen and tends to happen is that investors oversell these securities so much so that even though earnings shrink, price shrinks even more. And investors extrapolate these results into the future, even though this might not necessarily be the case. Businesses go through cycles and though many companies do fail, many learn to adapt and go on to have brighter days. So if we had to define value under a behavioral framework, we would think that value is the overreaction to bad news. Now this is only one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is momentum. If value is the overreaction to bad news, then momentum is the underreaction to good news. Just like I said, the other side of the coin. And what momentum investing is, is quite simple. Buy what has been going up. And even though that sounds too simple and maybe even a little bit dumb, it has worked in the past. Momentum, just like value, has delivered above market returns, at least historically. There are many theories as to why this happens, but I'm going to present to you my favorite theory, and I think it's best explained by AQR in their paper, Demystifying Managed Futures. Now, quick note, when I talk about momentum, I'm specifically going to be referring to what is called cross-sectional momentum, or simply put, buying a group of assets that have done relatively better than another group of assets. In this case, I'm specifically gonna be talking about stocks, and for example, we could be investing in stocks that have done better than other stocks, even though stocks as a whole may be underperforming. Let's see what AQR has to say. The 
economic rationale underlying trend following strategies is an initial underreaction to a shift in fundamental value which allows a trend following strategy to invest before new information is fully reflected in prices. The trend then extends beyond fundamentals due to hurting effects and finally results in a reversal. So let's break this down. First, we have a catalyst and that catalyst pushes the fundamental value of, let's say in this case, a company up. However, due to anchoring, investors do not readily jump into the investment for some reason. And you can think of anchoring as an error that causes investors to process new information based on old and it may be even irrelevant information. Then as investors continue bidding price up, many actually begin selling, not buying, due to what we call the disposition effect, which is another behavioral error that predisposes investors to sell winners too early and hold on to losers too long, which is quite literally the opposite of momentum. This should slow down the stock from reaching its fundamental value, which in turn makes the momentum effect even more pronounced. As momentum continues, at some point, the asset may even go past its fundamental value and investors start piling up as hurting occurs and the thing really starts looking like a moonshot. Eventually, all good things come to an end and the trend ends with a reversal back to fundamentals. You can see a developing argument here. Investing in strategies that take advantage of behavioral errors can produce pleasing results. And if we use momentum and value to juice up our returns, we can use one more strategy to help with the risk side of the equation. And that strategy is trend following. Trend following is a cousin to momentum as it uses a lot of the same dynamics, but with a slight twist. In the past example, you heard me talk about momentum as cross-sectional. We looked at stocks as a group and determine which ones have done the best and invest in those. With trend following, we only care about how an asset has performed relative to its own price history. Simply put, if an asset is going up, we invest, and if an asset is going down, we stay out. And like momentum, this seems a little too simple and maybe a little too dumb, but just like momentum, trend following has generally worked in the past, giving investors the chance to capture most of the return of a buy and hold strategy while giving investors a chance of avoiding the big, deep drawdowns. But let's ask the same question that we asked with our previous two factors. Why does this thing work? Again, many explanations can be provided, but I'm gonna talk about my favorite one here, and that is dynamic risk aversion. And here we have yet another behavioral error. See, when academics write papers, they make a list of assumptions in order to arrive at a certain conclusion. Well, one assumption that is usually held about investors is that they're rational, well-behaved people that tend to have a non-changing perception or aversion to risk. Meaning, no matter whether there is chaos in the market or there's greed in the market, investors behave similarly in both of those situations. Well, empirically, we can at least challenge that assumption. See, in the face of chaos, investors tend to keep selling, and in the face of greed, investors tend to keep buying. Trend following seeks to exploit these inefficiencies to make a robust framework whereby investors are likely to keep most of the upside of an investment while removing, hopefully, the big, deep drawdowns. So again, trend following is not there to enhance returns necessarily, it's merely a tool for risk management. Now, let's say we wanted to implement trend following in the stock market. Well, one way to do this is to look at a broad-based index, such as the S&P 500, and use that as a signal to tell us whether we are invested in stocks or not. If we don't invest in stocks, we simply go to cash. Notably, trend following can be used on any asset class, including things such as bonds and commodities. Now, trend following is notably not a silver bullet. In fact, it can fail miserably and constantly. See, most of the time a rule triggers, we can expect this signal to be a false signal or what we call a whipsaw. And when a whipsaw occurs, an investor has sold an asset in anticipation of further decline, and yet the opposite happens. An asset is sold, 
only for it to appreciate and now the investor must go back in and buy the asset again, likely at a higher price, realizing a small loss. So given the frequency of losses, how has trend following generally kept up with buy and hold? Well, it comes back to the magnitude versus the frequency of losses. See, with trend following, you can expect frequent losses whereby most of the time you're getting a false signal. However, when you do get a true signal, the magnitude of the win can make up for all of the small losses you've experienced. To give you a baseball analogy, a trend system may miss consistently experiencing many strikes. When it hits though, in light of the analogy, it's a home run. And trend following, as you can guess by now, is a really hard strategy to stick with, even more so than value and momentum, in my opinion. And put them all together, investing in value and momentum stocks, and then using trend following to mitigate risks, well, that can be a really painful ride. But that, friends, is how I invest. The point is this, if you're trying to get returns different from the market, you are going to have to look different from the market. And there's many ways to deviate from the market. There are good strategies, there are bad strategies, and there are honestly terrible strategies. But it's up to you to determine how you want to deviate from the market. That's it for today. Hope you enjoyed this content. If you did, make sure to subscribe, hit the bell, and tell a friend about this channel. If you want to see more content like this, you can go to Instagram and TikTok at Coffee Hour with Jose. I'll see you next time.